First Peter chapter 4 beginning at verse 12 through verse 16 I read today as always from the King James text here it is for those in the building today First Peter chapter 4 12 through 16 Beloved Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy if ye be reproached for the name of Christ happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part he is evil spoken of but on your part he is glorified but I've often said, but is the biggest word in the Bible. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Listen, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Mm -hmm. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. I want to talk to us today on the topic, It's on you. It's on you. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Master, we love you, God. We thank you. For the presence of the Lord, we thank you for the wonderful old songs of the church that admonish us, that encourage us, that inspire us. Lord, today truly it is my prayer. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. And Lord, today I'm glad that I've learned it is the love of God that lights my way. His love lights the way for me. As the word of God would now go forth, Lord, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Master, I need you to touch these meager, feeble lips of clay that they might today be used in your service. Master, that they might deliver unto every hearer a word that will inspire and challenge us and cause us, Lord, to step up higher in our walk with you. Master, today anoint not only my lips, but also the ear of every hearer. Touch the heart in advance, and till up the heart ground, that it might be prepared to receive today the seed of God's word. Lord, that it might have good ground uh, within which to take root, and take hold and to grow forth and bear fruit. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I was talking to a young lady. Tommy and I were talking to a young lady yesterday at a local Dairy Queen. We've been knowing her for quite a long while now. She always treats us real sweet. And she is a member of the LGBT community. And we were talking about, uh, you know, the possibility of relocation and having to move our ministry and all this. And I was explaining to her how that it is my belief, it is my conviction that this ministry is highly unique and very different than most. I know we're different than most so-called mainstream 
churches. But I also know that we are equally as different in many ways from LGBT affirming churches. This ministry does not know one song. We don't preach one message Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It's okay to be who you are. God loves you and He accepts you for who you are. And that's all you ever hear Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But I know from listening to various affirming churches online myself I know that many affirming churches that seems to be the only tune they know mm -hmm. and every Sunday it's the same message well that's all well and good but like I told this young lady yesterday I said I believe it is imperative for the life and the spiritual health of God's people that the ministry be balanced that the diet that is offered by the through the preaching of God's word be a balanced diet mm -hmm. it's so easy virtually every denomination every movement within Christianity almost every one of them they get stuck on one track or another and that's the only place they know how to go is that one track I was in the holiness movement for a number of years and I don't begrudge holiness people I'm not down talking them or anything there's a lot of wonderful godly sweet spirited people in the holiness movement of course there's also an equal number if not more of self-righteous morons who embarrass the faith and make Pentecost look like something to be ridiculed and mocked because they know how to talk in tongues and preach about talking in tongues but they don't know how to act like a Christian and live like a Christian and they don't know how to love and they don't know how to be gracious and they don't know how to be graceful and they don't know how to be merciful they don't know how to be kind they don't know how to be understanding and these are all things Christians ought to be I told this girl yesterday I said I'll tell you, ever since the Lord called me to affirming ministry back, and I started in 1993, I said, I'm going to tell you, I've been proud of the message that, that comes off this pulpit because it is a balanced message. We are a one God, Jesus name, apostolic, Pentecostal, tongue-talking, fire-baptized church. But... You don't hear me Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday always preaching on Jesus' name baptism or always preaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. You don't always hear me preaching in any particular vein. No, I preach what God gives me to preach. And I got news for you, honey. God does not feed his children a diet that is a bunch of junk food. No, God knows how to give the people of God a balanced diet. That's why the Apostle Paul said in one place, he said, I have not failed to deliver unto you, listen to me now, the whole counsel of God. See, not just part of it, but the whole council. Well, I'm going to tell you, from this pulpit, from this preacher, I believe the people of God receive the whole counsel of God. There are times when, like today, I have to preach a message that probably wouldn't fall under the category of exciting. <laughs> wouldn't call it the most inspirational message that you probably will ever hear. There may be parts, there may be things said that are, but nonetheless, it is a message that we must hear, especially in the church today. Too many Christians rail against what they perceive as persecution when the word of God admonishes us in our primary text today the apostle Peter said 
that we ought to celebrate such trials understanding that we are partaking together with the sufferings of the Lord when we are tried and when we suffer genuine persecutions. We ought to know that any suffering that we might endure for the name and cause of Christ will result in reward when we stand before the Lord. But too many Christians, especially in America today, want to avoid any and all struggle. All the while they still try to claim eligibility for eternal rewards. Oh, we want to do everything in our power God, to make sure we're not persecuted. We want to do everything in our power bless God, to make sure Christianity isn't ridiculed. We want to do everything to make sure that our walk with God is effortless and we don't ever have any mountains to climb or any stones to walk over or any valleys to pass through or any rivers to cross. My God, what's wrong with you? What a bunch of sissified weaklings there are in the church today. And furthermore, half the stuff they claim is persecution is nothing more than the natural response of unbelievers to their stupidity and their ignorance. They're not acting in accordance with the Word of God. That's right. And they're receiving backlash for their own ignorance and their own stupidity. Yep. Got news for you, children. It's on you. Look at my visual aid up over my head today. We have one woman standing there facing the crowd as it were. It's on you how they perceive you. It's on you how they see you. If you live like a Christian, if you live like a child of God ought to live, I got news for you. The Word of God tells me that the chances are uh, much smaller that you'll be persecuted and mistreated. Mm-hmm. Did you hear what I just said? If you live this thing, the Word of God teaches it. <coughs> the chances are much smaller that you will actually experience persecution or poor treatment at the hand of sinners or unbelievers. The problem today for most believers, however, is that the fallout they experience it's not related to their devotion to Christ or commitment to righteous living, but rather their inability, listen to me now, because you know this preacher, I don't mince words, but rather it is their inability to mind their own business mm -hmm. and maintain proper boundaries as they relate to the lives and conduct of of others. Mm -hmm. That's where the biggest problem comes today. Has nothing to do with you're not being persecuted because you're a Christian. You're being persecuted because you're an ignoramus. You're not being persecuted because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're being persecuted because you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ, but you obviously don't believe half of what he said, and you certainly don't live half of what he taught. Oh my goodness, is it okay that I'm talking plain? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, Brother and Sister Gillum, Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas, they were old-time holiness. She had the high hair and the long sleeves, and they believed in the old-time way. I know communities where the Jesus name message is despised. Because the local United, and I'm going to say the name, United Pentecostal Church in that community is full of a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites who run around acting like they're better than everybody. 
everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they wind up creating a reputation for this message that for my soul is so sweet. And they create a reputation for this glorious apostolic message that is repugnant and negative and vile. And people rebuff the message. They rebel against the message. They push the message away. Not because these people are godly people. But because they don't know how to live the life they talk about in their songs. Brother and Sister Gillum, every bit as holiness as First United Pentecostal Church. But you know what their reputation was? I moved to Fort Worth in 82, February 1982. I started attending Riverside Church of God. I began to go around town and do business at various vendors and stores and what have you. And every single time I happened to mention the name Brother Gillum, or I mentioned that I attended Riverside Church of God every time, Tommy. Do you know what I was greeted with? Oh! Riverside Church of God. Oh, that brother Gillum and sister Gillum, they are the most loving, they are the sweetest, the kindest people I've ever met in my life. My Lord, I'm telling you, you can just feel the love of God oozing out of their pores. What's the difference? What's the difference between them and those folks over there at that church that has people rejecting the Jesus name message. What's the difference? The difference is brother and sister Gillum knew how to live what the word of God teaches. They knew how to be loving. They knew how to keep their nose out of other people's business. They knew that it was not their job to make unbelievers and people outside of the church act like believers. They knew that legislating righteousness was not on the Christian agenda. They knew the Word of God nowhere admonishes God's people to get involved in politics and to try to legislate so-called righteousness. Honey, if you're not doing it for the right reasons, it ain't right regardless of why you're doing it. That's right. It's not righteousness if you're not doing it for the right reasons. If you're doing it to avoid going to jail, then it's not righteousness, sweetheart. Righteousness is when you do it because you know and believe it's the right thing to do. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So you can legislate all the so-called right things to do, all the moral conduct and all the proper behaviors that you want to legislate. But you know what? If you're going to stand there then and quote, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, then you're ignorant and you're stupid and you're foolish because you have not brought righteousness to your your nation, you haven't brought righteousness to your community. First of all, uh, the only thing that's created by new laws are new criminals. Every new law you create, you're going to have people who are going to break that law. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so all you do, every time you create a new law, you create a whole new breed of criminal. That's all you do. Okay, You can outlaw abortion until the cows come home. Got news for you. Abortions are still going to take place. Now, you're not going to have any stats on them. Now, you're not going to be able to know how many are happening every year. Hello now? No, because now it goes into a black market where it's not being uh, overseen and where there are no numbers being counted. So now you ignoramus, you're standing there so proud of yourself. Oh, bless God, we've reduced abortions from this many to this. Oh, no, you haven't. 
No, you haven't, stupid, but what you have done is you pushed a whole bunch of them now underground where they won't be counted. But that's not to say they're not happening. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm telling you, Christians today are experiencing all kinds of backlash and all kinds of negativity, and none of it has to do with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of it has to do with a hatred for Jesus Christ. No. Even Gandhi said, you're Christ I like. So it's your Christians I have a problem with. So it's not the name of the Lord that you're being reviled for. It's not the fact that you're a Christian. No, no, no. It's the way you represent yourself as a Christian. You're claiming to be a Christian, and then you're acting in ways that are inconsistent with Christian living. And people are causing backlash in your life, not because you're a Christian, but because there's someone who claims to be a Christian, you're acting like anything but. And that is what the Apostle Peter was talking about in our primary text today. He said, don't think it unusual that you would experience persecution or trials. He said, my goodness, why in the world would you think that's unusual? He said, no, rather than, rather than being upset by it, he said, you ought to rejoice in it. Hallelujah, because you're experiencing the pains and the suffering of Christ in your own life when you experience genuine, true persecution. Not this foolishness people are experiencing, which is self-inflicted. But then he goes on to tell us in verse 15 of our primary text, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. What's Peter saying? He's saying, listen, it's one thing to suffer because you're a child of God and you're a believer and a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's something altogether to suffer persecution because you're acting like a fool. Oh my goodness. And one of the things he identifies as acting foolish is being a busy body in other men's matters. If there's anything I learned growing up in the fundamentalist church, at least in my family, these people have no concept in the universe of boundaries. They think everybody's business is their business. They think, Tommy, they have a right to stick their nose into every bedroom. They have their right to stick their nose into every operating room. They have their right to stick their nose into every courtroom. They have a right to stick their nose into everybody's business. Because after all, they're not simply responsible for living the life for themselves that God has called them to live. No, no, no. They're also supposed to force you to live that life. Where do you read that? Where in the Word of God is that taught? Nowhere. That's where it's taught. And then they wonder why there's blowback. They wonder why people look at them and despise them and ridicule them. I want to tell you something today. The fallout they're experiencing is not related to their devotion to Christ or their commitment to righteous living, but rather it is due to their inability to mind their own business and to maintain their commitment to righteous living. My goodness, did you hear what I said? They don't know how to maintain proper boundaries. 
as they relate to the lives and conduct of others. Furthermore, most Christians are engaging in, in a number of ungodly behaviors and activities themselves. Christians today often embrace the same evil and ungodly attitudes and thought patterns as unbelievers. They are every bit as hateful, every bit as malicious, every bit as angry, every bit as interested in and prone to revenge as any unbeliever. If we live as God's people are called to live, the likelihood we would experience persecution or blowback for our conduct would be minimal. In Galatians 5, 16-25, the Apostle Paul writes, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. The term lusteth here had nothing to do with sex. Simply means desire strongly, okay? So the desires of the flesh very strongly compete with the desires of your spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So now he's going to tell us what the works of the flesh are. Are. Adultery, top of the list. Adultery. I'm going to tell you a little secret, America. There's probably 50 times as many adulterers in America as there are homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Fornication. I'm going to tell you a little secret, America. The definition the church has been pushing on you of fornication is a crock of nonsense and has been for decades. I don't have time to go into it now. One of these days I'll do a more extensive teaching on it. But within the context of the Old Testament law, there were very specific sexual activities which God uh, condemned or did not permit for whatever reason. Some of the things the Lord did not permit had nothing to do with them being unnatural, had nothing to do with them being wicked, had nothing to do with them being evil, but they did have to do with not contributing to the growth of the Jewish nation. And the Lord wanted the nation of Israel to grow. Talk to any rabbi, they'll tell you this. I've done my study. I've done my research. You do yours. The law, the, the many of the uh, dictates that God gave in the law concerning sexual conduct had to do with He wanted every sexual encounter to end with potential procreation. Why? Because God is obsessed with babies being born? Uh, no, because it's funny. We got people in America today who are anti- uh, abortion, but they don't have a thought in the world of putting a condom on or a woman having an IUD installed, hello now, or using any number of other contraceptives because after all, it's okay for them to tell God how many children they should have. We don't leave that in God's hands. Oh, no, 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 no. Now we make that decision for God. God knows I can only afford two kids. So that's why my wife went and had her tubes tied. That's why I went down and had myself a vasectomy. Is it okay I'm talking plain today? Oh, it's so funny, the hypocrisy and the stupidity in our number today. Got news for you. 
in the Old Testament law, God condemned everything from masturbation all the way down the list that did not result in a potential child being born for a reason. And any rabbi will tell you it had to do with the desperate need of Israel to grow its numbers for the sake of national security. They were going into the promised land. They were establishing a new nation. They were sending up boundaries and they had boundaries to defend against attack and invasion and they were very small in number they had to grow as fast as they could possibly grow so God said I don't want you doing a single thing that doesn't result in a baby being born because this nation for its own security this nation must grow as quickly as humanly possible and that's why God said that certain sexual activities were not permitted, including, I'm going to try to be nice, self-gratification. Yeah, that's right. The law didn't allow for that either. It's funny. The law didn't allow for that, but a man doesn't think a thing in the world about contraceptives. I'm trying to tell you folks, we need to start using our head a little bit. We need to start thinking instead of letting it be a, a paperweight at the top of our shoulders holding our neck down. We need to use our head as believers because a lot of the blowback that's coming against the church today doesn't have a thing in the world to do with being devout, with being committed to living a Christian life. No, it has to do with people professing Christianity but not behaving like Christians. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. So Paul tells us, he said, here are the works of the flesh. He starts out the list. Adultery, fornication. What's fornication? I'll tell you in a nutshell. Rape, incest, molestation, bestiality. Those items fall within the category of incest. When's the last time you went to any church and heard a pastor even mention incest? When's the last time you went to church and heard a pastor preach against child molestation or against forced sexual encounters, otherwise known as rape. When's the last time you heard a preacher preach on those subjects? But those are things that were clearly defined within the law of Moses. Therefore, those are the things that clearly are defined as fornication. He said adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, listen, hatred. I know more churches today got more hatred in them than the KKK. Mm -hmm. Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, love to argue, love to debate, love to fight. It's called strife seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, remember how I told you that's the biggest word in the Bible? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Listen to this next phrase. Against such there is no law. Oh my goodness. 
What is Paul saying? He's saying, honey, if you're demonstrating in your life the fruit, what is fruit? Fruit is the natural byproduct of a healthy plant. Did you hear what I said? Fruit is the natural byproduct of a healthy plant. Why do so many Christians today not demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? Because they're not healthy plants. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you want to be healthy, then you abide in Christ. But honey, we got too many Christians, they offer it around doing things their own way. They're not doing it Christ's way. They're not trying to act like Christ. They're not trying to be Christ-like. No. And they're unhealthy, and the fruit that they are producing is rotten, and it bears a stench, and the world rejects it. Mm -hmm. But Paul said, but the fruit of the Spirit, the natural byproduct of the Holy Ghost of God being in charge of your life, are these things, love, joy, peace, love, and he goes down this list. And then at the end he said, against such things there is no law. He said, honey, there ain't a legal entity on this planet anywhere that has outlawed any one of these things. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So you mean God would have us to live in such a manner that everything that is being demonstrated in our lives is perfectly legal and perfectly acceptable everywhere. Ooh. That's interesting. But Lord, you, you don't understand, Lord. I work in this office and we're supposed to issue marriage licenses and when the government legalized gay marriage, hallelujah, glory to God, I was going to take a stand for Jesus. I was going to take a stand for righteousness. I'm not going to issue those marriage licenses. Is that what the Word of God teaches? No, it is not. The Word of God teaches we're to obey the laws of the land. That's what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches we're to behave peaceably. The Word of God teaches that we are to quickly, quickly, quickly come to terms with our adversary lest he drag you into court. So if you're being dragged into court because of something you're doing, you're not doing what the Word of God said you ought to do. And you know why the Word of God said you don't want your adversary to drag you into court? Listen, here's what the Word of God said. Because you may lose. So while you're being dragged into court for your claim of upholding righteousness and godliness, and then you're praying, Oh Lord, let me win Jesus. And then Jesus is sitting there saying, You fool, I already told you. I don't want you acting like this. I don't want you doing stuff that is going to have people pulling you into court. And I told you that if you get into the courtroom, you're probably going to lose. So don't be standing here asking me to help you win. I already told you how it's going to come out. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, God's people are supposed to live peaceable lives. We're supposed to live lives full of love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then Paul said, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. What does he mean by that? He's saying, folks, if we genuinely are Christ's, then the things our flesh would want to do, the reaction our flesh would want to give, you know, the way our flesh would dictate we act. We done killed that off so that instead we could embrace what the Spirit would have us to do. Most Christians don't do that. They are not Christians in truth. They are Christian only in their profession. They profess Christ. But honey, 
If the fruit ain't there, the Lord said you judge a tree by its fruit. If the fruit ain't there and the fruit ain't good and the fruit ain't right, then guess what? Then that tree ain't what it's calling itself. If we live in the Spirit, Paul said, let us also walk in the Spirit. In 1 John 4, 14 and 15, John writes, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Listen. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Oh my goodness. Isn't that one of the things that we read a moment ago that qualified as the works of the flesh murders? Now John tells us that hating your brother is the equivalence of murder. And he says, and know in advance that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Am I telling the truth, folks? The Lord was not framed and crucified for his holiness and his godly lifestyle. That is not why they crucified him. He was murdered by malicious men because he dared to call out the hypocrisy of his contemporaries who claimed moral and spiritual superiority. He dared to expose their failures to do as God had called them to do, choosing instead to follow their own paths and to do things their own way, much like so many in the church today. Mm -hmm. Matthew 15, 1 through 9, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. We got people running around. They want to stone or murder LGBT people. And the Lord is saying to these scribes and Pharisees, Um... Don't you remember that God said that if you curse your parents, you were to be stoned? Listen. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias the prophet prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In Mark 7, 5 through 9, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not? Thy disciples, according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full will ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own 
tradition. We've got Christians so-called in the world today calling for violence and insurrection in our country. This is a stench in the nostrils of God. Nowhere in the Word of God is this kind of stupidity allowed. Nowhere. Nowhere is it called for. Nowhere will you find justification for this kind of behavior. But they have abandoned the commandment of men so they can embrace their own tradition. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Matthew 23, 13 through 30. Matthew writes, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the, waiter, the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. That's why he was crucified, because he called out the hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Not because he lived a righteous life, no. If you live a righteous life, honey, ain't nobody interested in bothering you. If you live a godly life, ain't nobody interested in bothering you. If you live this thing the way the Word of God teaches, to live it peaceably, showing mercy, showing love, showing patience, showing grace, 
got news for you, honey. You're not going to be reviled by the world. You're going to be appreciated and admired by the world. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. In Romans 2, uh, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? In the end, much of what we experience in this life is brought about by our own conduct. Our inability to live the way the Lord instructs us to live and our failure to manifest the fruit of the Spirit brings negativity into our lives. Not our godly living or our righteous disposition, the fruit of the Spirit, the Word of God tells us, is nowhere illegal or unwelcome. To suggest we are persecuted or mistreated for demonstrating and manifesting the attributes of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance is laughable. No, it's on us when we run about judgmentally being critical and condemnatory of others. It's on us when we choose to conduct ourselves in a manner that contradicts biblical teaching concerning Christian living. We can't blame others. You can run around trying to blame others all you want to, but it's on us when we do the opposite of what we're taught to do. Amen. And we experience negative repercussions for our ungodly conduct. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 6, 27 through 38, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if we love them, if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Did you hear that? He, God, is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. This is where they claim persecution. But listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. 
Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. How many Christians you know live Luke 6? But see, the Lord said a mouthful when He said, Judge not and you'll be not judged. Condemn not and you'll not be condemned. He wasn't talking about if you don't judge, God won't judge you. That's not what He was saying. He was saying, if you live a life and you're not running around sitting in judgment, everybody, guess what? People won't be sitting around judging you. If you don't live your life sitting around condemning everybody, guess what? People won't be sitting around condemning you. People love, human beings love to dish back what others are putting out. You know what I'm talking about? When you see somebody who constantly has something negative to say, Mary, don't you just love to put them in their place and, <laughs> and give them an ear and remind them of some of their garbage too? Yes. So when somebody comes along who's constantly judgmental, constantly critical, constantly negative, guess what happens? They're going to get that in return. From who? From people. That's why the Lord said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. From where? God? No. He said, Shall men give into your bosom? Why? Because that is the natural order of things. What we put out is what we're going to get back. That's why the Lord said, don't run around judging. Don't run around condemning. Show mercy. Hello now. Be forgiving. Why? Because that way people will return that to you in kind. Oh my goodness. Folks, this really isn't very hard. So many Christians today claim to believe the Word of God. But if they truly believed, why do they not even try to live its precepts and manifest its wisdom? You can claim to be a Bible believer all you want to, but a true Bible believer is one who lives what it teaches, not one who professes to embrace it as true and trustworthy. Claiming to believe the Word of God is one thing. Demonstrating you genuinely believe the Word of God by striving to live its precepts is the true way to be a Bible believer. Last passage today, Proverbs 15 and 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words stir up anger. Talking about the teachings of God's Word and living the precepts. In the end, we reap what we have sown. If we sow good things, the law of God states that we will reap good things. If we have sown negative things, we will, without question or doubt, reap negative things. Life for the believer can go so much more smoothly when we do things the way the Word of God instructs us to do them. When it's all said and done, my friend, the truth is, and it will always be this, the experience you live and the response to your faith that you receive from others is not on them, but rather... It's on you. Amen. Amen.